Yes guys, welcome back to another video. Welcome to the George Benson Football Channel. It is the day after Chelsea draw 2-2 at home to Everton and today I want to dissect did I call Graham Potter's redemption story a little bit too soon? Is it time to once again start really questioning Graham Potter? Is he the right man for the job? And the good news or the bad news is, in, in, I guess you could say, we've got two weeks now until Chelsea play again. And when you concede an 89th minute equaliser to a team fighting for their lives at the bottom of the Premier League, unfortunately, Graham Potter has kind of played his own way into these questions and opinions rising again. And I think what I want to do today is go over that match in a bit more detail. I was super tired last night when I did six things we learned. But if you do want to see the immediate reaction video, check the link in the description. And before I start going into this, and we will of course do player ratings in this video too, please do subscribe to GBFC. We're about to hit a quarter of a million subscribers here on the channel, so if you're not yet subscribed, make sure you do. And if you do enjoy these slightly longer videos the day after a game or the morning after a game, be sure to hit the like button on it. So, Chelsea, I wouldn't say came out the blocks firing in the game yesterday, I would say that we came out strong like we have done in recent other performances. Chelsea have naturally started well in games this season and then the capitulations tend to happen either when we score a goal and then start defending like we did yesterday, more details on that in a moment, or we concede the first goal, panic station hits and then we don't know how to score one ourselves and then we either scrape a 1-1 or we lose a game 1-0. That has been a staple part of what we've seen for Graham Potter's Chelsea this season. However, in the build-up to this game, we'd experienced three wins in a row and I think it's important contextually to look in brief details on each one of those three wins. Leeds United, ugly but necessary. Dortmund, emphatic because it's Champions League improvement. Leicester, was brilliant. At times we were scintillating. Still not perfect, but we were starting to see the wheels turning, the momentum. We were spinning. The engine was spinning. There were times again, particularly right up until the 62nd minute of the game, which is when Graham Potter made his first substitutions. We're going to go into just why he's done that. If I was to try and break down the reasons why, that was the key point and the turning point of the game. But until the 62nd minute, Chelsea were looking dominant. We were 1-0 up. Joao Felix scored a good goal. It's a brilliant finish, and he deserved that goal. I think he doesn't just deserve the goal from the way that he's been playing in the whole game up until that point, but in recent performances, he's had the woodwork being hit. He's had offside goals by fractional margins, and he has been working so hard for the team. But what I think we see when we're talking about hard workers... Timo Werner used to work hard for the team, but there's an element of finesse about Joao Felix that we never saw with Timo Werner. Timo Werner was sometimes a player who you would think when he'd score, he got a bit lucky with a bounce, or maybe it was a scrappy goal. With Joao Felix, there is that element of wow when he does something with the ball. Some of the little turns that he does in the half spaces when he's got his back to goal, the little flicks, positional awareness-wise... He's a fantastic footballer. And I think this summer, it is going to be a big decision for Graham Potter as to whether or not we really pursue an out-and-out -out number nine or with the arrival of Christopher and Kunku, Kai Havertz now scoring three and three. Is this really the, the upward curve that we can expect from him in the long run? Do Chelsea still need one? I absolutely believe we do. And then the headache comes with, if we also sign Felix, then what do we do with Nkunku? with Felix, with the striker, with Havertz. How do we fit all of these guys in? Good problem to have, but still a problem that would need a solution to be found. The rest of the attacking players yesterday. Kai Havertz had a relatively quiet game, wasn't running the channels as well as we saw against Leicester. Christian Pulisic, I think, did what would be expected of him in that role. There were moments where he got himself out of tight spaces, his dribbling was kind of predictable, and Everton defending the way they do under Sean Dyche, they pretty much knew when Pulisic was coming. He scored a fantastic goal, by the way, that was just unfortunately ruled out. Pulisic did okay, but I think overall, there still needs to be a shake-up here, and the biggest concern that I had was, why are we not finding Reese James? Why is Reese not involved in the game? Lo and behold, start of the second half, we start to see Reese get forward a bit more. Reese James gets into the box, wins the penalty. That's how Chelsea scored their second goal. 
We've got to talk now about the 62nd minute of the game. I think it was either the 61st or the 62nd minute when Graham Potter decides it's a good time to bring on Connor Gallagher. Now, this was a very predictable substitution based off of what we have recently seen work. Sean Dyche is a pragmatic manager to the point where he will look before Chelsea won these three games and be like, ah, all right, well, they struggle to play against the low block. That's naturally what we're going to do anyway. We can make things difficult for Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. Then he will take a look at exactly what we've done in the three games that we've won in the past three games. And a staple has been Conor Gallagher coming on. Chelsea are not confident enough to see out a lead, so don't panic. The score is 1-0 to Chelsea. Everton is still in this game. And lo and behold... Graham Potter makes that substitution again. My biggest concern here is that Pulisic wasn't bad, so it's not about he was desperately needed to be substituted because he was having a nightmare. My concern is, if Chelsea are 1-0 up at home to Everton, we've won three games in a row now. At what point do we stop trying to see out matches? And what point do we start smelling blood and thinking, hmm... Look at the way we've been playing for 60 minutes. We're creating openings. We're not having enough shots on goal. But we have the confidence that we are. We have the defensive ability. We're already playing three centre-backs. And we've got Reese James, Ben Chilwell. Two of the best wing-backs in the world. Why on earth are we trying to defend out a 1-0 lead at Stamford Bridge against a relegation, threatened, destined, whichever way you want to look at it. Depends if you think they're going down. Everton. They're not a dangerous team. Dwight McNeil... Looks good against Chelsea. Why? In the last half an hour, does Dwight McNeil look like a top-class player? Because Chelsea invited the pressure. Conor Gallagher coming on for Christian Pulisic. Conor Gallagher, when Chelsea are playing well, he works well as a box-to-box -box workhorse. When the game is going in Chelsea's favour, when the flavour of the afternoon is patience from Chelsea, but eloquence on the ball, we lost all of that creativity... The moment we start, or Graham Potter started, making that kind of substitution, inviting the pressure on the game. If you then look at the players who came on, Trevor Chalobah, Kane Chukwemeka, Ruben Loftus-Cheek. What Chelsea did here is leave Kai Havertz the furthest forward on the pitch, which is mind-blowing come the end of the game, considering we know Havertz doesn't operate best when he is the furthest most advanced player. You've left Kai Havertz the furthest forward, and you've almost got like a 5-4-1 formation to end the game at home to Everton. We needed a penalty to score our second goal, but I'm not going to complain about the way the goals go in at the moment because it's just nice to celebrate Chelsea scoring goals again. Do you know what I mean? But overall, this has to fall on Graham Potter. And as much as over the course of the past, what, week and a half, two weeks or so, I've been singing his praises. I said I wanted to sing his praises. I did not want to see Chelsea Football Club suffering and losing just to get rid of the manager. As much as I thought it was time to go, two weeks ago, the last four matches, we got 10 points out of it if you include the Champions League. Three wins, one draw, no defeats in the month of March. It's clearly an improvement and we're finally starting to score more than a goal a game, which we were struggling to even get one goal a game average before that. So there are definite improvements. However... To think that Chelsea fans will be happy to see Chelsea defend out a 1-0 lead at home to a struggling Everton is wrong. To even think that the personnel right now are good enough at this point, despite a bit of momentum being built, to think we're good enough with the players you're bringing on to be able to see out that kind of lead, no we're not. Chelsea, in the days of bringing on John Obi Mikel, you know we're not going to concede a goal. Why? Because those substitutions didn't really change too much the shape of Chelsea when we're defending. All of those players we brought on yesterday were attack-minded players. Players that wanted to go forward for players that wanted to defend. And all of a sudden, we're crowding out the back. Which inevitably led to openings because Chelsea weren't prepared. We didn't really know how and what we were defending yesterday. Because Everton weren't really offering much. So we were forced to defend because of the personnel on the pitch. But defend what? And in the, in the end of the game, we can see two goals, two, two individual errors from Koulibaly and Kepa. We're getting into player ratings in a second. And some awful zonal marking, which is once again on the head of the manager. Against Everton, when you've got runners like James Tarkowski looking to flick the ball on, this is how they score. Everton has scored the least amount of goals than any club in English football this season, I believe, from what I heard on the commentary yesterday. An astounding stat. 
And then they come to Chelsea and score two for only the fourth time this season. It's absolutely mad. I don't know how we've done this. But yeah, two pieces of awful defending, which once again, you can blame individuals for the second goal. But the first one is tactics. You do not set up against Everton playing zonal marking with their runners, who are their big guys, being marked by Chelsea's smallest players. It's stupid. It's pathetic. But we begin with the player rating, starting off with Kepa. I've given Kepa a lot of plays, Reece. Pre plays? Praise. He's also been having a lot of plays because he's been in the team. Three out of ten for Kepa. There's no doubt in my mind that Edouard Mendy saves the shot from Ellis Sims at the end of the game. No doubt that Bettinelli saves it. No doubt that Gabriel Salonina saves it. It's a pressure moment and Kepa fails under pressure again. You can also give argument that Kepa isn't demanding enough from his defenders in the box when Everton managed to win two consecutive headers to score their first goal. I'm not saying that I want Kepa to come out and claim that first ball that's flicked on, but you've got to at least be organising better than that. And if you are the vice captain of Chelsea Football Club, you look at zonal marking, and then you look at the players that are roaming free, Tarkowski, even Decore was lurking in the box, but... Everyone's frightened to move. The zonal marking system. Has Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool not shown us enough recently about how this is an outdated way of defending set pieces, especially against a team who are masterful from set pieces, who rely so heavily on set pieces? But we'll get into my manager's rating at the end of all of the players. Wesley Fafana, 7.5 out of 10. Another solid performance from him yesterday. And to me, once again, like I said in the game against Dortmund and in the game against Leicester, what epitomises a Chelsea display at the moment when things are going well is the way that those right and left centre-backs play on the front foot, winning the ball early, carrying the ball forward, allowing off the ball runs from Chilwell, Rhys James. Chelsea were doing that in the opening 12 minutes and it's how we gain control of the game. Wesley Fofana was making great runs. He's quick, he's agile, he goes off the pitch I think with an ice pack around his leg but he did a little interview, I think, and apparently it's not too much to worry about. 7.5, solid display again. Hopefully the injury is not too much. He's got his first France call-up, but back with a bang after the internationals. Koulibaly, it was between him and Fafana before the error that led to the equaliser for Everton. I was going to give Koulibaly a green box yesterday, even though he was one of the men in the wrong place. But then you kind of got to blame the manager for that for the corner. It is a silly error. To let an inexperienced... This is the thing here. We're talking about massive experience, Koulibaly. No experience, Ellis Sims. At Stamford Bridge, Koulibaly didn't do enough. It's a 5.5 out of 10. Kepa needs to do better. But once more, individual errors leading to Chelsea losing points. If we'd have won yesterday, we'd have started looking up the table. We'd have been two points away from a Europa League spot. I can't really say that without like a little wry, sarcastic smile. But that's what we've got to be aiming for at this point. Badia Shil, giving him a 6.5. I needed to change the ratings a little bit for the centre-backs just to differentiate the ones I thought were most influential. The one who was the worst and the one who just did all right. Chelsea concede two goals. Badia Shil again could have done better from the defense, defending of the corner that Everton scored their first goal in. Comfortable on the ball when he had it and was getting forward similarly to Fafana. Reese James are given a 6.5. He goes down in the area, wins Chelsea the penalty that Kai Havertz dispatches. But... In that first half, it's a shadow of the bombing forward Reese James that we've seen in the past. I don't know if this is a tactical ploy at the moment of Graham Potter, knowing that Reese James has been so good at bombing forward, getting back, doing everything that is needed out of a modern day wing back that he's done so well. And we're trying in game to manage the load of Reese James. So therefore, we're hitting it out to Ben Chilwell a bit more often. I don't know if that's the case or if Reese James just is still getting back to that full fitness, getting back to that match fitness that sees him dominate games for Chelsea. Second half, a lot better. We were finding him more. He was getting forward more, playing with confidence, running back, tracking back well too. And he looks a lot more fit than he has done. 6.5, good display. Ben Chilwell, I gave a 7. I thought Chilwell was good. I think the ball that Enzo Fernandez plays to Chilwell that leads to a poor clearance and Chelsea's first goal... Chile's just always available. Those long spreaded passes that we keep seeing now as a staple of Enzo's game, Ben Chilwell is always available for these. I think the way that he's been playing in March, Chilwell, it's, it's no doubt Southgate should probably be starting him for England right now. 
and he deserves that call up again. Enzo Fernandez, 7.5. I said it in six things we learned, but my energy was super low, so it didn't really come across that well. Enzo is very quickly becoming my favorite player in this Chelsea team. He has got so much class and exuberance when he's got the football at his feet. And for a player of such a young age, his spatial awareness is absolutely phenomenal. It's as if he's been playing the game as a midfielder for 20 years already. He looks like a veteran. Everything he does is handled with the most pristine quality and delivery. The passing is phenomenal. The speed of the passing, the decision-making time of Enzo Fernandez is sensational. And even when he doesn't have a standout game the way that I'd say he did against Leicester, he's still by far and above the best player on the pitch. And I think Chelsea, we're going to be talking very, very soon, if we're not already, about an expensive Premier League player who was worth every single penny. And as Chelsea continue to develop, whether that's under Potter or someone else, Enzo will be the first name on that team sheet. Mateo Kovacic, 6.5. Don't really think he was, at, he was as efficient as we've seen him recently. The thing that I've loved about Kovacic recently is Enzo being in the middle of Kovacic. There's less pressure on the individuals, both individuals there. Yesterday, I don't think Kovacic imposed himself so much. I think the shot, the chance he has early on in that first half that goes wide, he's got to do better than that. And we wouldn't be talking about it if Chelsea would have won the game. But unfortunately, when you draw 2-2 to a late goal, you're looking at those moments. You're looking at those opportunities thinking, could we have done better? Yes, we could have done. Kovacic should have scored. Joao Felix, I've given a 7.5. Again, some of the final decision making, the pass options that were available to Pulisic and Havertz. Felix could have done better. It's a great finish, though. And he's just got this... What's, I don't know what the correct word is. He's got this flair on the ball that we've not really seen from a Chelsea player. He's a workhorse, but he does it so elegantly. And when you've got a player who plays with flair, who can also execute things in an elegant manner, it's beautiful to watch. It reminded me a bit of Eden Hazard at times, when Hazard would be in these little tight pockets of space, and you see these little flicks that just involve his teammates, and you're like, how do we get here? How do we get the ball here? Joao Felix does that on a frequent basis. Scored a goal, his first at Stamford Bridge, 7.5. Christian Pulisic, 6.5. And the easiest way I can explain my thoughts on Pulisic's performance was, you know what you're going to get with Christian Pulisic? He's going to try and run around players. He's going to try to use his pace, but to no avail, really, again. It's kind of just like, yeah, all right, this, but there's nothing special. I want something special. I need something special. 6.5 for Christian Pulisic. Same as Kai Havertz. I gave him a green box because he scored Chelsea's second goal. Another good penalty under pressure. 3-3. Three and three. We're talking about momentum with Havertz. If we can get the levels that we saw against Dortmund, against Leicester, if we can get that every single game, then he's a guaranteed starter, whether Chelsea bring in bloody Ossiman and Kunku and Felix on permanent this summer. Kai Havertz, yesterday wasn't running the channels as well as we saw. And I think a lot of that, again... It's down to the fact that we didn't see Mikhailo Mudrik on the pitch yesterday for Chelsea. And that baffles me. Conor Gallagher gets a five because as soon as he came on, Chelsea's whole shape changed. And I don't know if we should be bringing on substitutions to enable Chelsea to continue doing what we were doing well, which was controlling the game yesterday. We were in control, conceded a goal from a corner and an individual error. But we also invited that which is why I've given Graham Potter a 2 out of 10. And I've got to be very, very honest about this here. Graham Potter is the reason Chelsea lost... Well, we didn't even lose, but it feels like a loss. Graham Potter's the reason we didn't win yesterday, because of those defence-minded substitutions. Mikhailo Mudrik was brilliant against Leicester, and then doesn't feature. He's fit. What's going on there? Noni Madweki. It's as if he's the forgotten man, since we saw a couple of brief cameos from him when he first joined. Why... A Chelsea making those level of defensive substitutions at home to Everton. If it's Real Madrid and you're 1-0 up, maybe. I'd understand it. And then if it doesn't work, it's probably going to be due to brilliance from Real Madrid. This is Everton. This is Sean Dyche, not Carlo Ancelotti. So I don't really understand the levels at the moment in terms of the substitution choices. One week it's working brilliantly. Yesterday it worked awfully. Everton weren't really offering anything. Why are we trying to invite pressure? We changed the whole shape of the game. And I think Chelsea was so... We had so many defence-minded players on the pitch that we crowded out areas which left space for Everton because we were 
all trying to huddle around certain areas of the pitch just to protect the goal. It's not needed. Sometimes attack is the best form of defence. And when players like Kai Havertz are scoring goals again, Joao Felix was doing brilliantly. Why bring him off towards the end of the game? Like the game wasn't won, but the substitutions that could have won us the game, Everton are going to go for it. They've got nothing to lose. They're fighting for their lives at the bottom. Bring on a Mudrick. Get a counter-attack goal. When was the last time we scored Chelsea? Blistering on the counter. There were moments yesterday where we were absolutely fantastic on the counter. And the way that we invited that pressure towards the end of the game is solely on the manager. Graham Potter gets a two. Do I think it is enough to start raising questions about Graham Potter out? Yesterday was his fault. But I'm looking at it as a whole now. As you guys know, I was backing him because the club decided to back him. And then results changed. And I was seeing tangible things that he was doing that were benefiting the way we played. My entertainment as a fan. The results, which is the number one thing. Yesterday, he's got to look at that. Take responsibility. That is your fault, Graham. But from where we were a month ago, this is significantly better. We've got two weeks now before the biggest month of your career. Graham Potter. You've got nine matches in April. Two of them are against Real Madrid, the most successful European club in history. Knock them out. Now we're talking, Graham. Get Chelsea into the European places during that period as well. Now we're talking, Graham. If not, with stuff like we saw yesterday, we see repetition with that. Questions keep coming. They deserve to keep coming. That's where it's at. We're going to talk more about this tactically. How can Chelsea be ready for those games against Villa, Liverpool and Everton before Real Madrid and Wolves? Not Everton. We've got Villa, Liverpool, Wolves. But yeah, subscribe to GBFC if you are new. Hit the like button if you like these more in-detailed match reviews with player ratings, post six things we learnt. And yeah, come on you blues, see you tomorrow.